Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is indeed a, a great day. Uh, there's two things that I want to do before I get to the sermon. One is that I want to make it clear that there is something that's been going around the church that uh, I want to clear up. And that is that uh, this will be my last sermon in this church. Uh, my job has transferred me, and I will be leaving on Monday with my family, and we are transferring to Gainesville. Uh, what made it difficult was that, number one, I did not want to leave. Uh, we really enjoy living here. And um, I don't make a lot of money at my job, but we eat. And so we were very comfortable here. So it was not easy for me to decide to leave. Ministry comes first to me and my wife and my family. And so in thinking that way, um, it was even more difficult for us to leave this church. So when I went to Gainesville and met with the pastor of a church there and had a very long meeting with him, I truly enjoyed the meeting. It was uh, very enlightening. He, uh, he actually knows the minister who first brought us into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ironically, yeah, they, have, they have worked together years ago. So there is a place for us in their church. Yeah. And so we're very thankful for that. Um, we are going to thoroughly, truly miss all of you. Um, I want to make clear that my phone number is in the bulletin. Anybody here can call me if you need to for anything. Because as I said earlier, ministry comes first to us. So even though we will not see you very much, you will still be in our hearts. We still love you and we will still cherish every relationship we have in this church. Now, what I want to do uh, before I preach this sermon is I wanted to thank the pastor truly from my heart because when we first came in this church it was not clear that we would be welcomed here. I don't mean to say that somebody in here didn't treat us very well and I don't mean to say we were ignored. What I mean to say is when you are a minister and you come into a church it is not easy to come in and say we would like to participate. It is not easy to tell a pastor that we are here to serve and not just here to sit. Sometimes pastors have their own agenda, and it doesn't include the newcomer. So this was made clear to us in a church we was in before we came here. So when we came here and we were welcome, and we were not only welcome but encouraged in our spiritual gifts to use them for the benefit of the church, it is a great tribute to the type of pastor that you have. And that is something that we do not take lightly. So I really, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank the pastor for giving us the opportunity to use our gifts to benefit this church. I also want to thank and say a very warm uh, goodbye to all of the others in this church. Some of them have really gone on a limb for this family. I don't want to mention their name, but one of the others in particular, uh, there was a time where it was questionable whether I could go to school to uh, go to become an evangelist. And somebody in this church said, if this is his desire, then we should embrace it. And it happened. So we, I really, I'm, I'm so thankful for the others in this church. One in particular I speak to regularly, and uh, particularly Gary, who is not here today. I will not forget when I used to work, we worked together at one time, and we had so much fun working together. I remember when Ray used to come to Home Depot and say hello to me. And whenever, whenever I see Ray in Home Depot, he would always encourage me. And I will never forget the days when he came in and just say, how you doing? How's your day? And to smile at him. I won't forget that. I won't forget the, the, the meetings that we have in this church. 
where I can see genuinely that the elders in this church really care about the people in this church. Amen. I wouldn't say that if it wasn't true. You are really blessed to have the elders in this church. I'm going to tell you something that I was almost more encouraged with than almost anything else. When I seen Bob, one day he was in charge of the service. And I couldn't believe at his age how vigorous he is. And he is truly encouraging because if Bob at his age can participate, can pray, can be in charge of the service, can do the things that he does in this church, even when we're not in church, then what encouragement is for all of us to be involved? So Bob, I will never forget you. You are truly inspired. And um, last, but really not least, uh, is somebody who is here that I want to say thank you to. And that's Don. Uh, Don has done many things that has not been asked, but to make sure that he looked out for our family. And I want to say here that we are truly grateful to Don for everything he has done since we have been here. Everything he has even not been asked to do that he has done. He is truly a servant in this church. And he is one of the people that I've made clear that we will know my, uh, we will know him done uh, long after we leave here. He will always be able to get in touch with me. And he will always be special to me. And I want him to know that publicly. Uh, now, one last thing before I get my sermon. There is a family here today who embraced us, who loved us, who cherished us. And although I won't mention their name, I just want to tell them thank you and I love them dearly. And I'm so appreciative, appreciative of them being here. And now having said that, I want to have a prayer. The second thing I said I wanted to do today is I went and I visited Willie in, uh, in the VA uh, hospital. And he is in full of spirit. He is, he is all right. Amen. And I've seen him and his wife. And I promised him that when I preach, I would say a prayer for him. Uh, he is, has to go through um, uh, physical therapy. He is going to have a prosthetic leg put on. And it is a very painful treatment. And so I told him that when I preach my last sermon, I would pray for him as well as for all of you, before I continue, I wanted to do that. If you would please bow your heads with me for just a small word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for each and every person in this church. I thank you for the opportunity that this church has given me and my family to come and to not just worship, but to serve. This has truly been an experience that we will never forget. And Father, I just thank them, each and every one of them, for everything they have done to serve this family, to praise your name, and to glorify everything that you have put into them to do. Lord, we said in your word that in all things you get, get an understanding. And sometimes when it is time to depart, there is time for misunderstandings. There is time for grief and for sorrow, but there's also opportunity to give joy to all that you have put in us. For this, we give thanks. Lord, we just ask you to, and we pray for Willie, we pray for his stamina, we pray for his wife, for his family, we pray that you shall strengthen him, that you shall, he shall recover from his spoken word, and he shall return to this church as is his desire to do. We pray all these blessings. And before this prayer ends, let me thank the pastor and let me ask that you extend a special blessing to his wife for all that she is going through and all that she's already been through. Lord, we know you said in your words that you will put no more on you than you can bear. And so we just ask you to bless her. Continue to bless this church as it will always be a special church in our eyes and in your mind. In Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen. 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 All right. I will.
I've been hugging the pastor when I get ready to leave, so I don't want anybody to have a problem if you see me cry. Uh, the scripture for the day was found in the book of Romans. And here's what I wanted to do. Um, I thought that it was necessary for us to understand why we pray. Why is it that it is so vitally important that we pray? That we have a strong prayer life? That we embrace the spirit of prayer? Everything that is done spiritually revolves around prayer. The activation of the Holy Spirit revolves around prayer. Not just for our comfort, not just for our knowledge and wisdom, not just for our understanding. We need to understand why it is that we pray. You know, when God created the heavens and earth, he did it with the spoken word. This is important to understand why we pray, because if a word is spoken in faith, then it shall come to pass. No matter if it's good or bad, we can bring things to our existence through the spoken word as the Spirit of God is in us. So it is important to understand why we pray. You know what is that uh, today in the church? The devil is very busy. He has taken prayer and turned it into a tradition that really means nothing. Most of the time we only pray when we got something in our mouths and we're getting ready to eat. Sometimes we only pray when we're in church. We don't see a value in prayer beyond the doors of the church. This is a problem in the church today. When we pray for each other, do we really believe the words that came out of our mouths? See, the Bible says when Jesus Christ returns, will he find any faith? How do we increase our faith? By prayer. Why do we pray? If we pray and not believe what we have just prayed, then there's no need to pray. Jesus Christ, but he did more than anything else. Do you know he prayed more than he slept? The Bible says to meditate on that word day and night. So the first advantage to the church to increase the gospel, to preach the word, to set the captives free, is to pray. Amen. When the disciples asked Jesus, well, in what matter do we pray? What was his response? He gave what we call the Lord's Prayer. And the first words out of your mouth when you pray is to acknowledge the Father. Because who are we talking to? We're talking to our Father. If he, in fact, is your Father. So it's important to understand why we pray is who we're praying to. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. So, one reason that we pray is for communion with the Father. I'll be going to the Bible in a minute. I want to set a foundation for not just why we pray, but why it is effective. Why does it work? And why it doesn't work. You see, it's easy for me to stand up here and say, well, the Bible says if we have faith in anything we ask, we can receive. That's easy to say. And some of us remember that and we know that. But the problem is, when the words come out of your mouth, is it coming out in faith? Is it coming out in belief? The Bible says, well, we must first know who God is. As we said in, uh, in our first scripture for the day, why would he not freely give to those who ask? And if that's the case, then why are we in sorrow in the church today? Why is it that when we have a need to pray, the first thing out of our mouth, the first belief is unbelief that this will happen? This is put into our hearts and into our minds by the end. Because the first thing the devil wants to do is take the word of God out of your mouth. To take the truth and turn it into a lie. So what we need to do is to start speaking the word, not just with confidence, but in faith, believing that what we say is the truth. 
If you begin in the book of Genesis and you read Genesis 1-1, what does it say? In the beginning, who created the heavens and earth? God created the heavens and earth. If you believe that, then you would not let anybody tell you that in the beginning something else happened. This is going around in the world today. See, it takes away, it takes the truth and turns it into a lie. Because if God did not create the heavens and earth, if the heavens and earth got here some other way, then where is our faith? Already, before we even go to Genesis 1-2, we've already lost our faith. See, one thing that we need to make clear, that we read the word in faith. We read the word believing that what it says is the truth. Because if it's not truth, then you might as well close up your Bible when we're done. And this is what's going around, even in the church today. An unbelief in the Word of God. That there is some other explanation. There's some other instances. There's some other theory other than what does say of the Lord. When that comes into our minds, see, the Bible says we eat the Word. Now, we know we just don't mean we take our Bibles and start chewing. What it means is that we take the Word and we put it inside of us. When we put it inside of us, it becomes a lie inside of us. See, the Holy Spirit is a person. It's a being that is inside of you. How do we activate the being? Through prayer. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 11, verse number 13. When we pray, there's basically two things that we pray for. Two things. The first thing when we pray is we either thanking God for something or we asking God for something. That's two things we basically pray for. The first thing is when we're thanking God for something. When we pray, we should always pray in thanks. Why are we thanking God? Because you are here. You're thanking God because you have your life, health, and your strength. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So when we pray, we must thank God. If we're not praying in thanks, we've already put unbelief in our prayer. So we must pray with belief. We must pray in thanksgiving. In the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse number 13, I'll read if we then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Everything we do in our spiritual life revolves around the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit, as I said, is a being that is inside of you, it must be active. And I'll tell you something, and this is the truth. Every person in this room, either the Holy Spirit is active inside you or it is inactive. One or the other. In order to activate the Holy Spirit inside you, to guide you, to strengthen you, we need to pray. And when we pray, the first thing we do is we give thanks to God for our being, for being here, and for our strength. So giving thanks is first. What did I say the second thing was? The second reason that we pray is to ask God for something. Turn to the book of 1 John 1, 1 chapter, verse number 9. John, 1 John, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Say amen when you have it. 1 John, chapter 1, verse 9, reads... If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we pray, if we have given thanks, the first thing we need to make sure we do after we give thanks is to repent. <clears throat> is to ask for forgiveness. Because what separated us from God in the first place? It was sin. What is still separating us from God? Sin. So when we give thanks to the Lord, we must ask for forgiveness. Now here's a question, and I want you to think about this question. Who is it that does not need to ask for forgiveness? 
Is there anybody in here who feels they don't need to ask for forgiveness? If we are, the Bible says, how many have sinned and far short of the glory of God? Oh. All. So if all of us have sinned, then we should all be thankful enough to ask for forgiveness. Before you ask God for anything, ask for forgiveness. This is important. The reason that it's important is because when you come to the altar, we must have clean hands. Do not come to the altar with unclean hands. In this church, we teach the sanctuary. And in the sanctuary, the basin that was in front of the altar, what was the purpose of the basin? To wash our hands. If the priest came in without washing their hands, what happened to the priest? They would die. They would die. Because that's a direct contradiction to the way God said it must be done. So when we come to the altar, there's no difference. If you come to the altar and your hands are not clean because you did not ask for forgiveness, then you are bringing a curse to your life instead of a blessing. Because it's either one or the other. Either the Holy Spirit is active or it is inactive. And if the Holy Spirit is inactive, what is our job, church? To pray. That it become active in every one of us. That's what we do. So we must ask for forgiveness. When we ask for forgiveness, then I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse number 6. Hebrews 11, verse number 6. When we ask for forgiveness and we have given thanks, then what is the purpose? We're here to serve. And in order to serve God, what do we need to do? We need to increase our faith. What is Hebrews 6, Hebrews 11, uh, verse number 6? The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh up to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Who wants a reward from God? Do you know the difference between a blessing and a reward? Do you know the difference? Yeah, I, mean, I said this in, in the Sabbath school one day, and I asked the question, what is the difference between a blessing and a reward? Nobody knows? A blessing, oh, you know? What is it? I have an idea. A blessing is uh, really given, and then a reward is... Um, Earned. 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 Uh, uh, you said a blessing is freely given yeah. and a reward is earned. Yeah, it's, I find it difficult to say that, that it's earned, but it's kind of like... Um, it's hard to say yeah. that, that God is saying that we need to earn anything right. because He gives freely to us. But the difference between a blessing and a reward, sinners are blessed. Everybody is blessed. If you are here on this earth, you are blessed. God freely gives blessings. But a reward, he said, is comes to those who do what? Diligently. Who diligently seek him. So if you are diligently seeking the reward of the Lord, then that's what a reward is. Amen. It, it's not, and I don't want to associate it with necessarily that we earn it. Because you really don't have to earn something from God. Diligently seeking him is not really earning it. It's serving it out of love. Because you, you, we serve them because we love them. We don't serve them to get rewards. We serve them because we love them. There is a difference. We don't want to confuse anybody. He's, the Bible says he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. So it is very important that don't misunderstand me saying we need to earn anything. When you are diligently seeking him, that means you are doing it out of love. If you are doing it for any other reason, then it is not a blessing from God. Everybody understand that? So we as reward to those who diligently seek Him. So when we give thanks to the Lord and we repent of whatever sin it is that we have done, then we need to understand that uh, we are here for service. We are here to serve. What good is salvation if you're not here to serve anybody? It's no good. Because remember, it's not just for you. It's for your brother and your sister next to you. The Bible says, remember, there are two great commandments. The first one is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. That's giving thanks. The second one is to love your brother as yourself. That's the service. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. So it's important 
that when we understand the power of prayer, that we understand that the Bible says that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. How many of us are diligently seeking the Lord? What, when we put the word diligently, what does diligently mean? Does that mean you show up one week, one day of the week, and go back home and go about your daily business? Is that diligently seeking the Lord? Does that mean we stick some prayer in there somewhere? Or how about everywhere? The Bible says pray without what? Ceasing. Without ceasing. That means our lives should be prayer. When you get up in the morning, the first words out of your mouth should be thanking the Lord. When you go to sleep and close your eyes, the last word on your lips should be thanking the Lord. When you're on your job, you're at work, and you're faced with a dilemma, before we solve any problem, we should be asking the Lord. Sometimes, because we're not used to it, and I'm telling on myself too, if you're not used to praying before you solve a problem, you solve a problem and then pray. I've done it. We saw the problem and then say, you know, maybe we need to pray. Well, wouldn't you have done that before we made the decision? I'm, I'm guilty. I understand. You know, sometimes I have a mind that thinks pretty quickly. And so I'm, I'm, I'm already saw the problem. Then I go to God and say, well, why didn't you come in here before? We need to pray. And so part of prayer and understanding a life of prayer, our life should be filled with prayer. Now, the next thing we need to understand, the purpose of prayer, why we pray, when we have repented, when we have uh, asked God to increase our faith through our prayer. We need to understand that the Bible says that the truth is revealed through the Holy Spirit. How is the truth of the Word revealed through the Holy Spirit? It's by prayer. So our supplication to the Holy Spirit and to the Lord is through prayer. That means that we should associate prayer with every study in the Bible. We should associate prayer with everything we do to serve Him. That means we don't read the Bible without praying. That means we don't study without praying. That means we don't serve without praying. We don't solve a problem without praying. We don't make any major decision without praying. What is the common denominator? Prayer. If you ever notice, the strongest Prayer warriors in the church usually have lives that deplict uh, a joy of the Lord. That's a true statement. You can look around in the church and you'll find the happiest people in the church are usually people who are prayer warriors. People who have a life with prayer and understand the power of prayer are usually the happiest people in the church. So for those of you who didn't know that, who didn't understand why a certain person is always seem to be happy no matter what's going on, they're a person in prayer. <coughs> that would be true in almost any church I've ever been in. And so we already know who the prayer warriors is. Sometimes you don't even have to ask who's a prayer warrior. Who's the happiest people in the church? Who's the people who seem to have a joy in their heart no matter what's going on? They're always people who pray. If you want to be on that list, start praying. Live a life of prayer. Then I want to tell you something else, which is something that came up today. Uh, consolation. And when, not just with the fact that we're leaving, but whenever we have to comfort each other, whenever we have to intercede on somebody else's behalf. See, most of the time in church, this is the only part of prayer that people understand but use it to leave.